And I want us to look at before and after pictures in Scripture today. But before I do that, we're going to be looking at, for, at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. But before we go there, I want us to start with Ephesians chapter 1. In the final verses, starting with verse 17, from Peterson's The Message. And this is the way Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I ask the God of glory to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for Christians. The utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on the throne of deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments. No name, no power exempt from his rule, and not just for the time being, but forever. He's in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body, in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. Let's pray. Father, the next few moments indeed fill us with your incredible presence. Empower us, empower me to speak, empower all of us to hear and receive the words that you would have us to share together. That your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as I said, we, we see in Ephesians chapter 2, a before and after picture. Uh, verse 3, verses 1 through 3, show us what we were like before our transformation in Christ. Verses 4 to 7 show the new us that transformed us. Verses 8 to 10 tell us a good deal of the purpose of the transformation. So let's look together at verses 1 through 3, the second chapter of Ephesians, reading from the NIV. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Here's the before picture. What we look like to God and what we smelled like to God, death, before our justification by faith in the blood of Jesus. The before picture is not very flattering. It's this. In fact, it's hard to imagine being much worse. Dead. The word Paul uses is dead. Apart from Christ, in our pre-conversion state, we were spiritually dead because of sin. The picture being painted here is of us being subject to the control of three things. Of us bound to them. Enslaved by them. It is worth stopping to note that Paul includes all three of these in describing our sinful nature. First, he talks about the world, our environment, the culture in which we live. The culture that we hear of the ocean are committed to transform by the power of the Holy Spirit. The world's culture works against God's purpose to keep people in sin. Look at the billboards, the advertisements, the newspaper advertisements, the magazine, the television. Paul cries out to the Christians in Rome and to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. A man by the name of J.B. Phillips did a translation that was very vivid, and he says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. That's vivid. Then Paul uses the, the, refers to the devil. Now, years ago, Merle and I lived in western Tanzania among the Wasakuma. And at one point, we encountered a young man in a church somewhere between Shinyanga and Mwanza. I don't remember the name of the village. But that young man wore a shirt with a message he did not understand. You see a lot of that in this part of the world. 
And, uh, you know, they have no idea what the shirt says. You know, the guy gets out of a truck. He's big. He's burly. He's covered in sweat. He's got three days of growth on his face. What's the shirt say? Baby on board. <laughs> or another guy, big, burly. He says, because I'm your mother, that's why. <laughs> anyway, this guy had a shirt. He did not understand the message, obviously. He probably found it in the Mitumba market. It was attracted by its color and the design, but the message printed on it had no significance to him or perhaps anyone else in his village where, where English was an unknown tongue. One Sunday morning, he chose to wear that shirt to church where Merle and I happened to be visiting. On that day, the pastor, and I promise, as their pastor, I will never do this to you. Okay? The pastor read off a list of everybody who had not come to the midweek service. And then he insisted that each one stand and present a defense of his failure. And that each one gave their defense. I had to go grind corn. I had to go fetch water. I had company. Each one was immediately refuted. Grind your corn earlier in the day. Give, carry your water earlier in the day. Bring your guests to church with you. They need this too. Everyone had an excuse until he got to the young man in the very back of that little mud walled church. The young man in the red shirt stood and quietly and shyly said, I have no excuse. But the words on the shirt answered the question in bold and vivid text. They said, The devil made me do it. <laughs> Paul, here in this letter to the Ephesians, talks more about the spiritual realm and its dark forces than any other, in his, any other of his letters, and more than any other New Testament writer. We all know the devil made me do it is not an excuse. It doesn't make us any less responsible for our actions. Whether it's failing in our commitments to each other, whether it's illicit sex, whether it's getting drunk, whether it's stealing the payroll or lying to your spouse. The truth is, the devil is active in our world and working to keep us from God and from becoming everything that God has planned for us to be and to do. Friend, if you do not believe that Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, you are due for a serious wake-up call. Then we come to the flesh. Verse 3 lists the third thing to which we're enslaved, our sinful nature, our old self, with its desire for evil and self-destructive tendencies. It does seem strange to describe ourselves as slaves to our own desires when our very culture defines freedom as basically the ability to do anything we want. Paul sums up the before picture with what may be the most uncomfortable idea in his letter. We were, by nature, objects of wrath. That's a pretty hopeless place to be. We have a technical glitch here. There we go. Wrath's a strong word. It means God's holy anger against sin and the judgment that results from our sin. That's the word Paul uses to describe God's response to our sinful state prior to our coming to Christ. You know, we don't talk much about wrath, about the wrath of God today. It's probably politically incorrect or something. Perhaps it's because we tend to see the wrath of God in opposition to the love of God. And so, feeling forced to choose, we opt to focus on God's love. But in fact, the two are not opposites. They need each other. God cannot be completely loving if he does not hate the things that rob us of knowing full lives. Similarly, he cannot be wrathful if he didn't care. Because if he didn't care, he would simply be ambivalent. And that's not God. The harsh reality is that outside of Christ, there's no hope of eternity. People that we care about, people that we love, desperately need to experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ and get out from under the wrath of God. So now we've looked at the ugly grossness of the before picture, and I haven't dwelt on it at length because I don't want to be negative. But let's look at the after picture. Besides that, I don't have time. When I wrote this sermon, I had a lot on the wrath of God. I had a lot of it. 
And I had a sermon that was going to take an hour and a half. And you, you won't endure that long. But we've looked at the grossness. Now let's look at the after picture. And these two pictures are separated by one word. The word but. In grammar, this is, no, B-U-T. In grammar, this is called a conjunction. A word that joins two ideas or phrases. And, but this one, but always demonstrates a contrast between the two. It's a word that may bring us either grief or joy, good news or bad news. Think about it, my fellow husbands. The question is, honey, how do you like this dress? If you don't like it, you will be wise to use the word but. And you better start off positive. Guys, I've learned this. You know, <laughs> there's, I've been on this road a few years here. And uh, by the way, we had a great day yesterday. I, I, I wish I could have been in two places at once. I wanted to be at the farewell party at Sid and Becky's for Alan and Annie. And um, Merle and I have missed too many anniversaries and birthdays over the years because of our ministry responsibilities and one of us or the other traveling to something. And uh, being together, I simply was not about to, to put anything in front of just being together quietly last night. We had a great meal. There's a little restaurant in Mikocheni called Kwetu. Or Mahali Kwetu. Our place. Best cook in town. You know, we had, we, we had delicious, delicious fire-roasted prawns, giant prawns, and grilled tuna that was out of this world. And I did it. And uh, couldn't have got better anywhere. Besides that, there was no noise, there was no tobacco smoke, there was no weird music playing. It was just us. It was fun. Anyway, fellow husbands, use the word but generously. If you don't like it, you'll be wise to say something positive. Like, wow, that fits you perfectly, baby. But the color just isn't you. And you're safe. Seriously. Unless, but I can't do that because I don't see the color. Okay. <laughs> but you're having dinner at the home of your future in-laws, since many of you are yet, not yet married. You're having dinner at the home of your future in-laws. You're not eating as energetically as Mama thinks you should eat. And she asks how you like the fried goat liver. And you answer, this is a lovely meal, but, but, but I'm really not very hungry. You say, wait a minute, Babu, then I would have to lie. No. You put fried goat liver, you put any liver on the table in front of me, and my appetite zoom, goes out the window. I want to take up fasting immediately. <laughs> now, if you don't feel that way about liver, then you're in trouble. In the Swahili culture, we use but a lot in greetings. You know, you can't lead off with bad news. You can't, say, you can't lead off with somebody and say, hey, John, my goat died. No, first of all, it's, you know, how are you? I'm fine. Lakini. You know, I'm fine, but the goat died. I'm fine, but my daughter, you know, you know I'm fine, but my, you know. But there's always, in fact, we had an experience with this the other day. Esau came in. We went through the greeting. Pro Esau's our driver. He also plays the, the drum set here. Esau came in, and uh, we went through the greeting process, and, you know, Mzima, Zuri, Sana, Lakini. Somebody got in my pocket on the bus last night and stole my phone and my driver's license. You know, but the but had to be there. All that to say that verse 4 begins with the word but. And here it jumps us to the good news of verses 4 to 7 as a counterpoint to the really bad news of death and wrath in verses 1 to 3. But, because, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us through Christ Jesus. Here we are. 
reading along, starting to feel hopeless and helpless and discouraged, overwhelmed by, by the wrath of God, overwhelmed by being so far from God's standard. And then we come to this little word, but. But all I have said is true. But you are not without hope. But there is more. But God. The next three verses describe the change that comes through Christ. The after picture. The focus is once again on God. Heart change can only come from the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One of the images the Bible uses to describe this change is the image of rebirth. The old dies, something completely new is born in its place. And that is a magnificent work of God. Verse 4 places the focus squarely where it needs to be, on God. Paul mentions both God's love and God's mercy. Each are emphasized with adjectives. Great love, rich mercy. And because of those two, characteri- those two amazing characteristics of God, two things have happened to us. First, we are made alive. This takes us all the way back to verse 1, where Paul begins by describing us as being dead. It's only natural and logical that the first thing we have in Christ is life. We were dead But we are now alive in him. That's our testimony. That's our witness. He has taken us from death to life. This incredible truth jumps Paul ahead to verse 8 to the point he's building about how this entire salvation is about the grace of God so that it overflows here as a brief taste of what is to come. It's by grace that we've been saved. Secondly, he says we are raised with Christ. As we begin, as we began this conversation today, we look briefly, but without comment, at the close of chapter one. The focus there is on the power of Christ, that Christ has over everything, because God has raised him from the dead and seated him at His own right hand. All the power that Jesus controls is ours to access. I'm glad that God's power is steadier than Tonesco's power. You know, it would be a lot more comfortable in here if we had a full energy charge from Tonesco this morning because uh, then the air conditioners would be working at, at full blow. But all the power that Jesus controls is ours to access also. It's no wonder that Paul began this picture with a focus on the great love and rich mercy of God. We are God's children. We belong there. That's where our citizenship is. That's where our loyalty and life and worship belong, seated in heaven with Christ. Why would God do such a thing? God did it to show the world what he's like. Here's a question for us. When the world looks at us, when the world looks at Bob McCulley, when the world looks at you, Do they see the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus? Do they see life? God saved us so the world would know what he is like. When people look at you and I, what do they see? Do they see Jesus? We claim to be God's children. My prayer for each one of us is that they would see Christ in us that those we encounter every day would taste something of his goodness and his grace, and that an experience with a Christ who is in us would generate within them an appetite, a hunger to see more of him. Can I run that by you again? That those we encounter every day would in that encounter, taste something of his goodness and grace that an experience with a Christ who is in us would awaken in them a hunger, an appetite for more of him. Not more of me, more of him. Jesus himself says to us in Matthew 5.16 that we should let our light so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We'll come back to works in just a minute. Now, let's look at how the transformation happens in us. Verses 8 and 9. Verse 8. It's by grace that you've been saved, through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, this is the very core of the gospel. 
the heart, it's the heart of the book of Ephesians. Now, if you don't know these two verses by memory, I would encourage you this week to make it part of your focus. Memorize Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not by works, so that none can boast. These words succinctly and powerfully state the incredible message of salvation. In God's great grace, he has offered us salvation and eternal life with him. With faith that he writes on our hearts, we receive it. And just in case we make an assumption that we are something great because of the exercise of our faith, Paul quickly points out that it's his doing, not ours. It's nothing we've earned. It's simply a gift to be believed and received. This is the incredible simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's really difficult to understand why this is really so hard for so many people to accept. Why we can't just accept the gift. Maybe it's part of the devil's plan to convince us that we have to earn it. We have to work for God's love and approval rather than simply accepting his gift by faith. And that's a lie from the devil. But sometimes we struggle with that. Perhaps you struggle with that. Do you find perhaps that your, your service to God has become an attempt to earn his love and his acceptance? In essence, trying to earn your salvation? Verse 10 gives us a reason for it all. For we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know what? Don't stop with verse 8 and 9. Add verse 10 to that. For we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I don't care what translation you learn it from. Much of the scripture that I learned over the years is from the King James, and I just keep repeating it. And some of it I've memorized from the message, some of it I've memorized from J.B. Phillips, other places. In fact, I was reading this very passage today in my daily reading. It just, uh, uh, it, the world would call it serendipity, somebody might call it coincidence. The day that I have to be preaching from the first portion of Ephesians is the day that my annual reading schedule brought me to the first three chapters of Ephesians. I thought it was wonderful because I read it from a translation I had not used in preparing the message and it was just eye-opening for me. Anyway, the first thing we notice here is that we're God's workmanship, his handiwork, his craftsmanship. The Greek word that Paul used is the root of our word poem. The word is poema. The idea here is one of pride in something you've made. You know the feeling? You know, I, besides being a cook, I'm also a carpenter. And I, I love working with wood. I love taking a piece of wood and just shaping it and and making it into something either functional. It's With my work, it's normally more functional than it is beautiful, but something that meets my needs. And I hate having somebody else do it for me because they never do it the way I want it done. But if I do it, it takes a lot longer because when I'm working with wood and with tools, and you know, if I'm going to cut a piece of wood, I have to meditate on it. You know, it, do I really want I'll measure again. Measure again. You know, the rule is measure, th measure thrice and cut once. And uh, so I make sure, is that right? Yeah. And then uh, still once in a while I make a mistake. But I enjoy building things. And I enjoy fashioning beautiful food, tasteful food. And when I do, when I succeed, I step back. Well, with the food, you know, I stick the spoon in the pot. Mmm. Yes! But with a cabinet... You know, if the door is simply closed square, I'm happy. <laughs> if it sits straight on the floor, I'm happy. I gave Merle a wood carving for our anniversary, and I realized today that one foot doesn't quite join the rest of the feet. You know, it's got one foot up in the air. I don't think he meant that, but, you know, his table was different from our table. Uh, but we have that craftsmanship. We step back, we admire it, we tip our head a little bit, we look at it, we think about it. And we're proud of it. We're happy with what we've done. And that brings to mind craftsmanship. That's what we are. We are. You are the craftsmanship of God. Yeah, when you look in the mirror, you shake your head and say, no, God, you couldn't have done that to me. No, we're God's craftsmanship in our spirits. God made us. We're God's, we are God's poem, if you will. 
I believe that God has a purpose in every aspect of his creation, even in creating each of us. And it just happens that the Apostle Paul and I are in agreement on this, and we see that Paul moves now to describe the purpose for which we're created. To do good works. There's a wonderful balance here, a tension between verses 8, 9, and verse 10. Because, my friend, works don't save us. They don't make us more holy. They don't make us more spiritual. They don't even make us more important to God. But works of service flow naturally out of who we have been made to be by the craftsmanship of God. God made us to do something besides sit here or there. God made us to be participants in the kingdom. We're not saved by works, but we're saved for works. We're saved to work, to do the work that God intends us to accomplish in our life for him. That work is important. It's crucial. But it doesn't earn us our salvation or any more of God's love. But they do serve to build the kingdom, and and our obedience in doing them does earn his favor. Not his forgiveness, not his grace, but earns his favor. And let me just illustrate it this way. How many parents? How many parents? Moms and dads. Okay. Now, you love your kids, right? Be honest with me. Do you always like your kids? Uh Uh-uh. No. I love my grandchildren. There's sometimes I don't even like my grandchildren. You know, when they melt down, I want to leave the room. I do leave the room because I I don't want to be involved in disciplining my grandchildren. But there are times I don't like their behavior. I don't like what they do. So I never stop loving them. I never love them less. But but when they are behaving in a way that they're expected to behave, I will respond positively to that behavior. You with me? Somebody nod your head, say amen, something. That... You know, when, when they behave the way we expect them to behave, we will want to encourage more of that behavior, and we do it by bestowing favor on them. Okay? I think God deals with us the same way. When we, he promises that when we walk in obedience to him, when we do his will, when we serve his goals... His blessing abounds. If we do not tithe, he does not love us less. Not tithing does not imperil our salvation and it does not imperil our relationship with God. Okay? Other behavior, other behavior counter to his will does not necessarily imperil our salvation, but, faith, but behavior in line with his will and his plan for our lives will incur his blessing. Can somebody say amen to that? Or am I completely out in left field? Left field, baseball term, okay, sorry. Um, and I don't play baseball. Our works flow out of who we are created to be. They are the result of not only of our salvation, but they're the result of our joy in our salvation, but they are not the cause of our salvation. And it's critical that we grasp this difference because it's extremely motivated that we be, it's extremely important that each of us be motivated to serve. We serve because of who we are as saved children of God and not out of some frantic sense of trying to work our way into heaven. Honestly, every day in Splash, every day at the harbor, every day serving coffee, every day doing something around the ocean will not take you to heaven any faster. Or any higher. But it will help you go deeper into your relationship with God. Because you see, God has prepared, from the text, God has prepared all these good works in advance for us to do. I don't have to create them. I don't have to go looking for them. I don't have to rely on my own strength to design them. 
God has them all prepared. He has the opportunities laid down in front of us. The, oppor- the appointments are scheduled. Merle and I have a friend named Amy Young. Amy arrived at a church in America wounded and almost broken. A single mom with a whole lot of baggage and a whole lot of scars. But in that church, she began to find healing. And she knew that she had found the church where she wanted her little girl to grow up. Their kids' program has a different name. It's not called Splash. They call it Rainbows. And every week, Amy would drop her little girl at Rainbows and go on into the sanctuary. One day, one of the Rainbow staff spoke to Amy at the door. And she says, you know, we really need some help in here. We'd love to have you join the team. Amy is still quite a new Christian. She gave a good Christian answer. She said, okay, I'll pray about that. To which the leader responded by taking her arm, pulling her into the room, saying, you don't have to pray about this. Just come and do it. I like that. Today, Amy Young is in full-time ministry, loving God and doing incredible work for the kingdom. As we end today, the first question I need to ask is whether your life, are you in the before picture or the after picture? Are you under wrath or under grace? The second question is whether you know this grace that brings salvation And when I say no, I mean in your heart as well in your head. There's a song, I asked if the band knew it, I wanted them to sing it today, but I guess they didn't know it. The words go something like this, now I see the walls I built are falling, and your waves of grace are washing over me. It's a good picture of God's grace, washing over us like waves at the ocean. Oh, I like that. Washing over us like waves at the ocean, cleansing us. My prayer is each and every one of us will know that grace. And finally, would you anticipate the good works that God has prepared for you? Take your focus off yourself and look around and see what opportunities are before you here at the ocean. Opportunities that God has for you to show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. In closing, I want us to look back at this passage we opened with. But this time from the message. Pardon me, not the passage we opened with, but from our text, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm reading from Peterson's message. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world that doesn't know the first thing about living tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us knowing what we felt like doing. Doing what we felt like doing. When we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us with all the time of the world and the next shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he's gotten ready for us to do, work we had best be doing. So let me finally close with this announcement. As the bellwether at the ocean. I'm giving every one of our ministry leaders open license, a free hunting license. To fill the ranks of our staff in all our departments. 
It's time to do more than pray. To, it's time to do more than pray that God will send laborers into the harvest. It's time to recruit. So if someone comes to you and invites you to work with them, they've already prayed about it. I've already prayed about it. Go for it with my blessing. In one way or another, we need many, many of you involved. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, Father, I just pray right now for these, your people. Father, indeed, that grace will abound in their lives. And if there are those here today who haven't experienced that grace, who are still living, doing the stuff that incurs your wrath, Father, I pray that today you would give them courage not only to turn from that, but to turn to you. Choose to follow Jesus to experience your grace in a simple prayer of simply saying, God, I receive. I accept your forgiveness. I want to be your child. I want to follow Jesus. And Father, for each of us, I pray that you would give us courage to look beyond our skill set. One might say, well, I'm an attorney. I'm a lawyer. I'm a solicitor. I'm an accountant. I'm a, I'm a bank manager. What on earth can I do with children? God, let them see there is love in them that can flow to those kids. Father, I pray maybe there's somebody that just feels terribly shy and isolated. Give them courage to reach out and join hospitality, uh, to blossom and bloom. There's all kinds of ways, Father, that you have prepared people to serve this body, at this body, to serve this city through this body. I just pray you to give us courage to follow. Courage to join the adventure. Courage to be everything you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Looking at some takeaways for us today, stuff to pray about, think about, talk about. Number one, memorize Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. This week, and encourage others in your expo group to do the same. Two, discuss in your expo group and with friends and family. Here's the question. I'll confess to you, this question has been on the screen. It's on the opening screen of my laptop computer. And it's been there now for over a year. I see it every time I open my computer. It's a question that's always before me, and I'd like it to always be before you. What do you believe that God has placed in your hands, in your life, to steward for the sake of the kingdom? I remember when I first saw that question. It was a crudely handwritten sign stuck with tape on the wall of a conference, a small meeting I was attending. And around the room, we were all multitasking on our computers, paying attention to what was being said communicating with each other at several levels. And I looked up and I saw this piece of paper on the wall. What do you believe God has placed in your life, in your hands, to steward for the sake of the kingdom? And I broke and began to weep. Because I realized I had gifts I wasn't using. Gifts he had given me for the kingdom. I sat there and repented change my behavior. Third, pray together about the answer to that question and ask God, where can I serve at the ocean? That's it.